All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Alex Klein. I'm a curator here at the Institute of Contemporary Art uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. We're located at 36th and Sansom Street. And if you haven't been to our museum before, we are free for all. Um, tonight, we are broadcasting live from the galleries within the exhibition, Broadcasting EAI at ICA. And we are having a conversation titled Broadcasting Transmission. I am joined tonight by my co-curator uh, and colleague, Rebecca Clemen, Director of Distribution at Electronic Arts Intermix, and artists Ulysses Jenkins and Sandra Perry. Um, a brief note before we dive into everything. Um, this uh, television show, which you're tuning into now, um, is taking place within an art gallery context, and we're really excited that the exhibition, which is themed around broadcast, um, has the opportunity to go back out into the world over the airwaves and on Facebook Live. So good evening to our viewers at home um, and online. Um, the exhibition uh, was really thinking about uh, broadcasting not just as a, uh, a maybe a technological signal, but thinking about also the metaphor of planting seeds and dispersing them widely and making connections between people and communities. Um, and maybe, Rebecca, would you like to say a little bit about Electronic Arts Center Mix? Uh, EAI was founded in 1971 by a then gallerist named Howard Wise who was getting really excited by what artists were doing with technology in the 50s and 60s, especially around nascent video technology in the late 60s. It became available as a consumer. Um, uh, video cameras became available for the first time, and artists and activists and uh, individuals were taking advantage of this technology specifically to have a connection to a participation with television. So that was a very important connection that Howard made in an exhibition called TV as a Creative Medium in 1969. It was the first exhibition of its kind in the United States. And that exhibition inspired him to close his gallery, which had been focused on artists working with kinetic and light art and uh, found an open EAI. Our primary role is as a distributor. But actually, for the first couple of years, EAI's uh, main service was to offer editing facilities and continue to continues, in fact, to operate as an editing facility. In fact, Sandra Perry edited uh, a work at EAI and is probably one of the most recent artists to work with us. So we continue to function in that capacity as a site of production and also dissemination. And that was really one of the driving forces behind um, wanting to do these conversations is acknowledging EAI not just as uh, a service, uh, a distribution service, but as a site of intergenerational conversation uh, and production. Uh, so with that, perhaps we want to introduce our artists. I'll begin with Ulysses. Um, so really honored to have Ulysses Jenkins visiting us tonight from Los Angeles. Uh, Ulysses is a visual artist who has consistently interrogated questions of race and gender as they relate to ritual, history, and the power of the state. In addition to his solo work, he was a founder of Video Venice News, a Los Angeles media collective in the early 70s, and had an association with the artist group Studio Z alongside figures such as David Hammonds, Sangha Ngudi, and Marin Hassinger. And he has done many collaborations with Sangha Ngudi and Marin Hassinger in particular. Um, Jenkins explicitly comments through his media work on racism embedded in popular culture and its effects on subjectivity. Group exhibitions include Now Dig This, Art in Black Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980, which was at the Hammer Museum and came to PS1. Video, studies, video studio playback at the Studio Museum in uh, Harlem, New York. Sympathetic Magic, Video Myths and Rituals at the Armory Center for the Arts, Pasadena, California and California Video at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. He lives in Los Angeles, was born in Los Angeles, still lives there, and is Associate Professor of Studio Art and an Affiliate Professor of the African American Studies Program at the University of California, Irvine. And we're really thrilled that he's here tonight. Thank you. And, and we'll get the introductions kind of out of the way. Um, and I, it's just my absolute pleasure to welcome Sandra Perry back to ICA. Um, Sandra is uh, an artist based in Perth Amboy, would you say? 
Um, and she, I am just absolutely fascinated by the way that she uses uh, the digital tools of production to both critique and mobilize questions of representation um, and really kind of unveiling uh, the kind of the themes within our technological uh, moment. Um, and in her work, she's often using her own body, sites of community, and family narratives uh, to kind of question uh, what we see and how we see it and how those images um, that we ha consume in mass culture uh, are produced and how they might be maybe torn apart. Recent solo exhibitions include Typhoon coming on at the Serpentine in London and also in Bridge and Donahue in New York in 2018. Uh, as well as Ecologue for Inhabitability at the Seattle Art Museum in 2017, and her phenomenal Resident Evil at the Kitchen in 2016 in New York. Uh, she's been included in numerous group exhibitions, um, most recently Trigger, Gender as a Tool and a Weapon at the New Museum in New York, um, and we can look back also to the Greater New York exhibition, MoMA PS1 2015, and of course, uh, the exhibition that we produced here in 2017, Myths of the Marble, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So, so with that, um, I think we're gonna begin with a brief overview of both of your practices so that we can dive into a, a meaty conversation. So Ulysses, um, even though many people might know you uh, first and foremost uh, as a, a media artist working in video, um, you really have a background in painting. And it was really interesting for us to, to discover your early work in mural making. Yeah, I uh, began in, uh, from my undergraduate studios, uh, studies, excuse me, uh, as a painting and drawing uh, graduate, and uh, when I got out of school, I began uh, painting murals. As you can see, uh, the mural that is being featured here uh, was one I did on a DMV in Los Angeles. Uh, if you can't tell the scale, that's three stories high by myself. Um, and so the title of that piece was uh, Transportation Brought Art to the People. And uh, there's one, this little, the picture which would be on uh, your right side corner here is me being congratulated by our first and only African-American uh, mayor, Mayor Tom Bradley. Um, but as you can see, there I am uh, on the scaffolding and uh, it was quite an adventure to say the least. Scale and what have you. And soon thereafter, um, can you talk a little bit about how in, in the culture of Venice you, you came upon beginning to work with video? Okay, well, I started, I was painting murals and one of the gentlemen who was in the video, uh, Venice News, um, asked me about this video workshop that was occurring on the boardwalk. And he said, are you interested? And, you know, independent video was very new, and um, let's say uh, the beginnings of independent filmmaking was also on the horizon. And I was very curious about it, and I said, well, at first, I've got my wall to keep me warm, so I think I'll take a pass. But eventually, my curiosity got the best of me, and I went down, and uh, I was fascinated. The, the whole thing, of course, with the early video was the fact that you could record things and then erase them. And at the same time, uh, you could become your own producer. So from that standpoint, I was very curious about what you could do. Meanwhile, there was this event that you will see here called the Watts Festival commemorating the riots. And the thing was, the news media was telling everybody, don't come to this event. This was, a, I think, a ploy by the police to maintain not only crowd control, but to just keep people from coming who from outside of the community to come to the event. So I said, well, why don't we just go? This was like my first time. You used to, we used to check out this equipment on a personal basis. And so I said, let's go to the festival. 
and we'll show what really is going on. And so that's how this uh, documentary came to be. It's with the, also the advent of the porta pack in the late 60s, which made yes, it right, impossible. Right, because of, because of the porta pack, we ended up having the opportunity to be on stage with this group. You ever heard of a group called War? <laughs> and so the, actually the recording in this video happens to be actually one of the few uh, actual live recordings of them performing live. Mm -hmm. And it also featured, I mean, is this, is, this is Cecil Ferguson, right? Yes, yeah, Cecil Ferguson. So it also, I mean, crea it was also a, 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 an important, it also stands as an important document now, um, in addition to the, this intervention in mass media and, re, you know, making your own images. It also now has this doubled function, function of important people like Cecil Ferguson on tape talking about the work that they're doing. Well, that, for the most part, for those people who know the history of, of this medium, a lot of what was being recorded uh, for the first time were documentaries of this sort, community-based. And of course, with Cecil, who started out as a janitor at the uh, County Art Museum, eventually becomes a curator through his interests and what he was trying to do, especially for the African American community. So when I had shot this uh, footage of the, of the festival, I was able to get him and his wife to have a conversation with me since he was an original uh, resident of the Watts community. So fast forward a few years, <laughs> but you know this kind of maybe early work where you are, you are maybe right. reclaiming images. Do you want to set this up because we actually have a short clip okay, that we're well, going to play? This is massive images, and for the most part, I was very uh, curious about the notion of the black image in Western art, and to whatever degree how most of the time in the Western art uh, context the black image was usually presented in a context of servitude. So I've, I thought that, well, they're carrying this over. It, you know, they carry it over in radio. They carried it over in television. Anybody know Amos and Andy? So I said, I need to try to, if I was gonna be in this medium, I wanna recontextualize how people understand this established stereotype to whatever degree that you guys may, anybody into old dirty bastard? I mean, that's a stereotype, okay? And unfortunately, the thing with stereotypes is they pay for you to make a fool of yourself. I think women are hip to that now. And so that's what I was trying to, you know, dispel. So we'll play a short clip. You're just a mass of images. You've gotten to know from years and years. The hurt and pain. The hurt and pain. The hurt and pain. The hurt and pain. Was written and bitten. Was written and bitten. I don't. Into your vein. And I won't. And I don't. And I won't. I think the sun. And late. I think the sun to the You're just a mass of images you can't know. You're just a mass of images you can't know. The whole thing. And years and years of TV shows. The whole thing. The hidden pain. And to your hidden and to your head. I don't. I won't. If I don't. I won't, but for some, we I think, but for some, to, I think, to, You've got to know. You've got to know. But 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 you've got
a TV show. The hidden pain was written. The hidden pain and was written. Into and bitten. Your into. I don't. Your I don't. I don't. Relate. I won't. And I think we're Relate. done. It's too late. And I think we're done. It's too late. You want me to talk about this? <laughs> Can we say something about massive images? I think we should say something about massive images leading into this, because there's a nice exactly. connection. But maybe when, when you made it, and then what it led to. Uh, you mean two-zone transfer? Well, massive images, when, when it was oh. made, and then maybe the transition into Otis Although, and the well, community. Well, massive images that. was made in, uh, I believe, in the spring of 1977. And I was preparing to go to graduate school. And I wanted to make a, a a piece of work that could give the faculty at that time that I, where the college I was going to, an indication of what I wanted to study. And so for the most part, what a lot of people may today not think about, that there was necess wasn't necessarily a path for me to follow. There were a lot of other African-American video artists, although I found out there was uh, another gentleman named uh, Tony Ramos out here on the East Coast who had been working in video, uh, and another guy named Ed Burrell, who was working in LA. Uh, anybody heard of Bodacious Bugarula? That was the name of a group, a performance group, and he was doing a, a black version of Laugh-In. So, yeah, right, it was a while. So, uh, <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, when I saw that piece, it influenced me to make this piece, Two Zone Transfer, which again, back to the study that I was pursuing, trying to dispel this, the misnomers about the black image in, in, in television at this point in Western art. And uh, Two Zone Transfer, actually, the title comes from in LA if you're taking a bus from one side of town to the other, which would geographically put you in two different neighborhoods you had to ask for a two-zone transfer. <laughs> so. And at this time, so Carrie James Marshall is in this video. Oh, yeah, Carrie, and yeah. From people familiar with Carrie James Marshall, I went to school with him. And we had a lot of interesting conversations along these lines. And I came up with the idea that I wanted to make this project. And he actually was kind enough to perform in it, so. Uh, Specifically as uh, a minstrel wearing a Richard Nixon face mask. Right. Oh, Maybe so just say a little bit mo more about the <laughs> yeah. uh, iconography in Two Zone Transfer, which <laughs> for me, Two Zone Transfer also speaks a little bit to Twilight Zone. I don't know if that was, that's uh -huh. maybe too literal a connection right. that I'm making. But anyway, just this idea of Well, the whole thing about the imagery. minstrel show, see the minstrel show was created in a way to bring the black characters into the entertainment business by uh, uh, the Barnum Bailey uh, circus kind of sphere. And at that time, the Industrial Revolution was occurring. You had all the immigrants from Europe coming into New York, but they did not have any kind of representation for the black people who were living in New York. So this blackface character gets invented. And at the time of that, Blackface minstrel shows became so supposedly the moniker of black people, and um, so we use this notion in this in this performance to tell the story of the black minstrel and how uh, that uh, disenfranchisement had uh, been the way in which black people were to be considered as a stereotype. And you see it go on from that time onward into cartoons and all this stuff. And for the most part, this whole notion of what they do say in the video, blackening up. Uh, so that when you have Bert Williams, who is a very light-skinned black man, happen to put cork on his face to be in this particular, uh, let's say, entertainment field, 
I mean, Bird Williams was making more, more money than the president, blackening up. So what does that say to a person's character? Because that's basically what it is, disenfranchising yourself. That's generally what happens when you play a stereotype. So oh. You've performed a lot in your work especially in these earlier. Yeah, well, in the early days I did. Yeah. yeah. So I just wonder, maybe we could, you could transition into also talking a little bit about doggerel, because that's something I think we also want to pick up on. OK. And then this is the work, actually, Inconsequential Doggerel, which has been on view during the run of the exhibition. Well, Inconsequential Doggerel was a change that I wanted to make early on in my career, but I had to hold off while I was in grad school. Uh, it also said something about something I'd also discovered. Actually, for, for those who may not have had this experience that I'm about to describe to you, when I was in grad school, the students, my Caucasian friends, told me that I could forget about having a career in the art world because I was going to have to copy their culture. And that kind of disturbed me from a standpoint that I said, well, why is that? And that was because the notion of what an African-American cultural identity could be. See, when I, when I this now, time-wise, this is 1977, 78, 79, and the whole, the whole thing of uh, identity politics, multiculturalism, it was about to break open, okay? And for the most part, I said, okay, I'm gonna have to show you. But the thing that they did indicate to me is I still needed a form or a forum by which to present what I was thinking. And I turned to the notion of ritual. And that's what inconsequential doggerel, first and foremost, is, is, is a ritual. And of course, all of, a lot of my friends that I made uh, at that time were also doing rituals. I mean, they mentioned Mir and Hassinger and Sangha Naguti. I think you might have heard of David Hammonds. So that becomes the language among us, at least, by which we spoke to the public and to another degree amongst ourselves in terms of ritual. Um, so in terms of doing that, that's what inconsequential doggerel is. But the term doggerel became the form that allowed me, to, I thought, mostly uh, gave me the capability to speak of my own means of speaking to a public. Uh, a regular variation on a theme, a, sometimes a comedic verse, irregular measure. And I got that. I got that definition from Marlon Brando. You know, he, you know, the guy who didn't accept his Oscar because of the way they were treating Native American people. And so, I thought, dog. You know, there was an article in the L.A. Times in the calendar section, the entertainment section, and he was playing S Superman. And <laughs> you guys can't see the, the cameraman who's wearing the super S here. Um, and for the most part, they, the interviewer asked him, how was it playing Superman's father? And so Brandel says, well, you know, I liked it. But I re what I really liked were those dog roll moments. And I said, what is, those, what is the dog roll moments? And so he says, in between, the space in between when dialogue was being delivered, there was that space in between. And as an actor, you can interpret that space in one way or another, excuse me, which is what actors do. And I realized, I said, Jesus, that's what, that's what we as black people have been doing all our lives interpreting this irregular space. So I began to use this term doggerel in a way of defining my work and to a way as a, a, a way of seeing uh, culture and context. 
So in consequential dog roll is what this video is describing, and you have that not only in the manner of how you view the character, but in the process that's involved in making the video. Because we're cognizant of time, I think we're going to talk about one more work. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, I ran off at the mouth. No, no, no. We, no hopefully, we can come beautiful. back to some of these. <laughs> but we wanted to land on uh, bay windows oh, uh, yeah. because this was on view during the run of the exhibition, and it was uh, for us a really revelatory uh, work in the exhibition. And it really conveys this idea of transmission too that we wanted to focus on tonight. So maybe if you could say a little, a little bit, bit about yes, this project. Just a little bit. <laughs> well, and the, and the video phone technology that is being this, demonstrated. This was a piece that I did in uh, San Francisco when I had moved to San Francisco and it was made at the Exploratorium. And I called it Bay Window because in a way I was de describing a, a portal into actually as you may get a bit of understanding from these stills. Uh, a te technological view of how we saw the world. But at the same time, it really was a multi-location uh, kind of construct. We're using uh, long distance calls to like five different locations simultaneously. And in that sense, I'm, I don't want to describe, I can't describe to you the whole uh, technical structure of it, but in doing such a thing, we were able to establish what only was going on in these various locations, but we had discussions about the social uh, circumstances of that time. In a way, it was like my inconvenient truth piece of, of that time. Um, because there one guy who was in it from Baker Lake in Canada was telling us at that time in the 90s, the Native American people were having problems with water rights. And of course, our wonderful oil companies were trying to take the rights of this lake, Baker Lake, and just, just end up destroying their fishing rights by doing so. And so when they, when they said that over the, over the phone lines, it's within the construct. There's basically to do this, I'm, I must explain this to you. You had to have at least two, two phone lines, one for the visual and one for the audio. Okay, and I had given um, Rebecca a picture of the, uh, the um, Panasonic black and white video phone, but you know those different kinds of devices that you see in the news where you see somebody who's robbing the 7-Eleven and this picture is in a quadrant? We started using those to use as a video phone uh, distributor because you could have color video. So back in those days, this was in the 1990s, Amiga made the only computer that you could have color video and play with software. And so we would just, you know, disorient or orient, however you want to look at it, the, the image, and then send that signal to the video phone and then send it back out to other people. So that's partially a brief description of and Bay Window. happening in different media centers up and down the coast in Northern California, right. Southern California, and in Canada. So thinking about how different that is also from the immediacy that we have. I just remembered now. the guy's name who was in Seattle. It was Hank Bull. Hank Bull, yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Western Front. Right. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. All right, so uh, we're going to proceed to Sandra now, just so that we can have you two have a dialogue. Um, let me just. And hopefully, we'll have a chance to get back. These to are some, some of other these. works of Ulysses that we're just going through. This is Planet X, Still of Sun Ra, um, and this is a pro. This is a um, oh, yeah. casual video documentation of a visit <laughs> by David Hammonds, um, and all of these are works that I encourage you to revisit at some point. Um, so we just perhaps through EA. Perhaps through EAI, yes. Um, okay, turning it over to Sandra Perry. Um, and Sandra mm -hmm. interned at EAI in 2011, so I've known you for a long time, and um, you've been a major 
force in my life for a while. Um, and it's just a thrill to be sitting here and be talking about your artwork. Um, so beginning with double, quadruple, et cetera, et cetera, um, this is from 2013. Um, sorry, one and two, double, quadruple, one and two, which was recently exhibited at The Kitchen. I think maybe that's one of the most recent um, presentations, if you could say something about this. Um, thank you all. Um, happy to be here. Uh, so this is a um, frame by frame animation um, of two of my friends, Jordi Mignana and Danny Giles, um, kind of moshing in the studio. I asked um, if they could do these 30 second performances, which is kind of like um, a layover from the work that I'd been doing, or the last pieces that I'd been doing in undergrad, which were performances that were um, shot um, kind of like face forward um, and then kind of like slowed down. Uh, so there is no manipulation other than like the, the content aware uh, tool in Photoshop and each frame covering the body with the rest of the space. So that's kind of how that tool works. It just like accumulates um, kind of like pixels from around, you know, kind of uh, what you're covering. Um, yeah. And how is the work um, exhibited? Do you have a preference for how it would be displayed? I prefer these things to be um, projected uh, because I, like, I'm really into kind of like psychic spaces and intentionality. Um, and I think that there is something kind of interesting that happens when they're kind of across from each other, projected in a space where your body is kind of like encompassed by the movement. Um, I think. Uh, the reason why I chose um, Danny and um, Jordi is because we were at a residency together and essentially all we did all summer was drink and dance <laughs> at night. Um, and uh, just watching them move on a daily basis, there's just like something in their movements that felt really kind of like present and like kind of like urgent all of the time. And so I wanted to kind of capture that, um, that ability to move through space while also kind of like thinking through what it was to represent them. Um, and so thinking about kind of like an, a, like an energy imprint um, onto kind of like, a, onto like the digital space instead of maybe their bodies kind of like telling you something about them. Yeah, I, their bodies are, are, are moving, you, you, uh, they're there, um, but I was trying to kind of do some, some other stuff, yeah. I mean, maybe because we also asked Ulysses this question, but what, because you began as a ceramicist, yeah. can you talk a little bit about what, what made you embrace the medium of video? Sure, I mean, yeah, I went to school for ceramics. It's like, I'm one of those people who like shouldn't have graduated from high school. <laughs> it's just like all of this, like all of this luck stuff um, and other things, I, I suppose. Um, and, you know, I didn't go to museums or galleries or anything during that time. And I went to, um, this, in the second day of, of college, we saw Art 21 and we saw the Kara Walker kind of section and it, it messed me up in like many, many, many ways. And at that moment I was like, oh, there are so many things I can do. Like art is so, is, is so full. So I wound up doing a lot of stuff in the school and wound up line, um, like kind of uh, landing on um, sound work and then moving into video later. And I think the, the transition was really easy for me because um, the program I went to was really still very interested in kind of like, um, I think, hand processes. So we were learning um, to make video first and first in the studio with these, um, uh, with these like uh, security cameras that you'd patch into a bay. So you'd make sure the image was stabilized and then you'd um, uh, fix the color and then you would get your, um, your signal. Uh, so it was all very process-based, something I was very um, kind of familiar with through the ceramics process. So I think this, um, uh, my interest in the tangibility of video, of signal, of these things being kind of like very much so based in, um, in, in the physical, as well as kind of having this ephemeral kind of thing. Um, I got there closer, I got, I got there sooner because of how I was taught video in the first place, yeah. So the connection to ceramics and process is really, I don't know if I've heard you artic articulate that before. Um, moving on to this other, uh, this performance work, public uh, project in Harlem, 42 Black Panther Balloons mm -hmm. from 2014. Yeah, this is okay. Um, I, <laughs> uh, I was like collecting all of these civil rights like pins just on my own like time on eBay. And it was, you know, that page that they, that they place 
when you're like search the same term over and over again. So it was like Black Panther was a term on my on my page, and I was scrolling, and there was just this balloon that said Black Panther balloon on it. And so it's one of these things that's made somewhere with tiny hands, I'm sure, like very <laughs> terrible labor pro um, practices where they all kind of look the same. So the lion looks the same and all this stuff, but it's just black, and so it just wound up there. Um, and so I brought as many as I could and got them filled on 125th Street and walked down the street. And it was a, like a really kind of lovely time. It took about two hours, um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you have a different relationship to it now. Yeah. I feel like we have a lot we could say about it, but yeah. let's, let's move on. Moving along to uh, young women sitting and standing and talking and stuff, no, 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 mm -hmm. from 2015. Yeah, so my friend Jordy, um, back again, um, and a friend Alana and Victoria, and we were all at Columbia, like, that's like the big deal. So many black women <laughs> that, were, that were there. That was nice, um, but uh, I'd done these performances with these masks before, they'd, like, they'd had a couple of iterations of these like kind of rolling eyes, um, and they were attached to performance where I was making, like, I was making pancakes, but through these kind of elaborate, like, DIY, not quite working the right way, like, mechanisms. So, like, we'd make the pancake mix in a bucket and then have it suspended from the ceiling and then um, have, like, a rolling kind of, like, um, uh, cooking surface that we'd just, like, roll and then, like, try to, you know, um, pour the pancake mix on and these things. And we were wearing these, like, kind of glasses as, like, I was really and very much so still into these like um, these ways that labor happens and and the ways that you can I'm not sure if subvert is the right word but like kind of do some trickery inside of the, um, inside of that labor like understanding that labor happens and that there are certain bodies that like um, or people who kind of like live in that space all of the time and what's available to you so I was thinking through this kind of like never ending eye roll um, I, I had to work all through school. Um, and doing um, fry cook kind of work. And so the first iteration of that wound up happening there while I was in undergrad, um, like making things in the gallery and then like slowly pulling pieces of my hair and spitting it out. So like maybe if they saw me there and then they saw me in the cafe, you know, there was some of that energy that pushed over. It's like be, be nice to the people who are, you know, um, like making your food, you know, or else, or, you know, some type of like, uh, thing, so they wound up kind of being subtracted or abstracted from that kind of like labor practice. And this is a video where there are um, a bunch of these amazing folks who are oh, Jordy didn't go to school with us, but she yeah she was there. Um, who were basically just thought, I just asked them to come together. I thought they would get along. They did, and they wound up talking about being kind of like first generation um, immigrants and like what it. Um, what it meant to be here and all of these things around paperwork and um, uh, all like a bunch of conversation that wound up just like kind of floating um, pretty naturally. So that's what that performance was. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead just a little bit so that we have time. This just to make mention, this is my Twilight Zone thing from 2014. Um, but if you could maybe speak to this, uh, this work, Lineage for Multiple Monitor uh, Workstation number one from 2015. This is like just um, um, uh, my first kind of diving back into chroma keying, which is just um, it's a post-production technique where the foreground and the background are separated from each other. And so um, I went home to Perth Amboy and asked several of my family members to um, do a series of like uh, things that felt ritualistic. Um, some, none of them were really kind of like true or things that we did on a regular basis, but this work I was trying to think through what it is to make portraits, and um, I, I think what I found is that like that's an impossibility. And so, what what happens when you make images of people? And part of um, this is they, they have these masks. Yeah, they have these masks that kind of approximate that color. So, um, trying to kind of like think through this like um, communal or um, this uh, this group kind of like aspect of these people you assume that you know, which the piece kind of like. Um, uh, unfolds, you know, I, I have these like uh, these moments with my mom and my grandmother and all this stuff, but how you can even keep, like leave some type of space, some representational space for people, um, even who you even feel like you know, like really intimately to kind of like be who they are or still kind of like um, allow a space for them to do what they're gonna do. 
um, like through the image, like mm -hmm. sometimes even through kind of like the annihilation of them, you know, through that, yeah. And then in just, this is a composite version which does not reflect the installation, which yeah. is very key yeah. to this work, which um, maybe you could speak to. Yeah, it's a two-channel work and I've been really into like kind of multi-channel video just because it gets people literally like moving through a space and um, I think it's, uh, or, or like kind of like expanding the narrative through these multiple channels, um, like allows a, a, bit, a bit of like the understanding that you're not getting the thing, um, or you're not getting a complete kind of like vision, and that like, and there being like some type of like um, pleasurability or something, or like um, some like a, something that doesn't feel like a loss, mm -hmm. you know, because you're not con like consuming the image of these people right, all of the right. time. Yeah. Um, well, maybe now we're going to go to, um, oh, sorry, this is another uh, representation of Leonard from Multiple Monitor Workstation, just to give a sense of the two different, cha to two separate channels, which would usually be experienced. Um, and maybe we'll just talk about one more work and yeah. show a short clip. That sounds great, yeah. So this is Grafton Ash for a three monitor workstation um, from 2016. Um, and we do have a clip to show. Uh, I don't know if you want to say something before showing the clip. Or? We can show the clip. Okay. Do you like our audio? We looked up music for relaxation on YouTube and found this. It's called Deep Sleep Ocean Chill Out by Neural Beat Music for relaxation slash meditation slash wellness slash yoga slash exorcism slash lounge slash entspannungs music. Hi there. Nice to meet you. We're the second version of ourselves that we know of. We were made with Sandra's image, one of them, captured with a Sony RX100 under fluorescent lights at her studio in Houston, Texas on April 15, 2016. We were rendered to Sandra's fullest ability, but she could not replicate her fatness in the software that was used to make us. Sandra's body type was not an accessible pre-existing template. Cool. All right, so this is, um, yeah, Ashen Graph for a three monitor workstation. If you see, that's perfect. Um, there's like a kind of like a white mark on the face and it's uh, where you kind of like, it's this program where you just like, you plaster a face on this thing. And so there was something that went wrong with it and I just thought it looked ashy, like it needs lotion. So I called it Ash and Graph for a three monitor workstation. That's a joke, you laugh. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually, I don't know if you have an image, but it's couched inside of um, uh, a workstation. It's a machine that um, has pedals and a we desk have attached other things, to it. kind of. Oh, perfect. Well, yeah. That's, that's yeah, fine. There you it's go. Right, right there. there. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the, the, the work is like, a, I'm basically, I'm interested in what like self-actualization means and I don't think it's like real. Um, and so I was trying to make myself in this program just playing around and I realized that I, that if I tried to kind of create myself, like I couldn't and like a big part of that was like my fatness. It's like you can't make a fat body in that thing. And so um, we were just talking upstairs about like, like uh, uh, these ways, oh, what were we talking about upstairs? Um, 
I, I just totally <laughs> um, But anyway, so about the avatars, the avatars and, 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 and like kind of realizing yourself in kind of digital space and what's available to you. And I don't think those things are available, but the machine or the avatar has like gone through the internet and found this real study from VCU about the just world theory, which is if you're a good person, good things happen to you. But the inverse is also the thing you believe too, which is if you're a bad person, bad things happen to you. And so it found that in the study that the African-American participants, if they believed in just world theory, had higher instances of um, heart problems and stress. So this thing has concluded that if you believe the world is a good place, then you are likely to die faster, especially if you are um, a black person or marginalized. And so this, this object that is made to labor, um, it is a machine that's made to, um, to actualize bodies, has realized that that is not a possibility. And so what it's decided is that you know, being grumpy, being cynical, a bit of that is actually necessary for survival. And so what it's done is it's, um, it's telling you this thing. It's something that it's learned from. And it's also um, making modifications to its body. So if you get on the, those, that machine, um, I, I mean, it, it's made for my body just so I can get in and out of it without breaking it, but it's incredibly uncomfortable and the, the, the pedals are on backwards. So it, it makes it harder to actually get a, to get a workout. Right, and his is a, another one. Yeah, that's one another one. Yeah. That one's covered, the, in, like the, imped, the, the impediment is that it's covered in um, Vaseline. <laughs> so maybe I'm gonna, kind of skip over this work that was we had on view here at ICA, but maybe this is a good kind of entry point to kind of talk about um, both of your interests in, in images that are out circulating in the world and how you can trouble them or reclaim them or problematize them. Well. <laughs> Looking at you, you'll see. No, I'm, I'm, I, find your, I find your work fascinating, actually. Uh, to the way that you are exploring uh, using the, the, the green screen technology in particular. Because a lot of people, I mean, I'm coming from, now you, you say you were in ceramics, and I'm coming from a painting background. For me, the green screen provided me to do this technique in painting that's called glazing. Mm. So when, when I was a painter, I learned that with glazing, I could superimpose images on top of another layer of imagery, mm -hmm. which I thought was, wow, okay, now, we were talking earlier about surrealism, now I can get surreal with context of what I wanted to make, which you see a little bit of it in Planet X, and then uh, some other works where I, I use uh, more green screen technique. But you taking the whole thing, I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm going like, now, can you work out on that technology? You could, I, would, I wouldn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not enjoyable, I, and that's like kind of the point, to make it a little, okay. um, yeah, a difficult. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I thought, wow, man, this is, you can really transpose yourself with, with what you're up to. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm uh, I th with the the green screen and blue screen. I'm I'm kind of interested in what like the kind of like the ghost of the space before anything even happens in there. Mm -hmm. You know, about all of these decisions that are made before and after production, but really about like before and after kind of like culture. You know, um, like the the remnants and um, and what has yet to come. Um, and really kind of meditating on all of these um, decisions that get made and what is possible um, or the possibilities that are, that are, that are there um, when people do things in groups. You know? And so, I don't, and so I, I don't think that they are utopian spaces for like, you know, your beautiful projections of what the future can be. It's like, who, who said like white supremacy is basically solidarity? Like, you know, it's like lots of things happen when people get together. And so it's a, it's a space that, you know, is, is full, um, but it's also kind of, um, it's also the caution. It's right. also a space of like, uh, let's, let's think through, but to maybe together, which is why I like making installation work. Right. Um, Cause it's likely you're gonna be there with people. Yeah. yeah. See, it also makes me, reminds me of Avatar. Mm. If you've ever got a chance to see the production of Avatar, 
I mean, it's a total green screen world. Mm -hmm. And the, what happens in the production of that, or for that matter, most science fiction films of today, you can't have the kind of effects that you see in uh, Star Wars or, or Star Trek mm -hmm. or what have you. And, uh, you know, it's funny, because, I don't know, because of the political atmosphere we're living in today, but they've got lots of sci-fi TV shows now, mm -hmm. you know, to get you away from thinking about now, mm -hmm. uh, because you could escape. Mm -hmm. Do you feel you can escape in your work? No. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I feel like if I wanted to escape, I'd make those like exercise machines a little bit easier for me to use <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> or something like that. You know, I think that like, I think sci-fi, I think sci-fi is super interesting because I think it, the, I think good sci-fi kind of like comments on, on now in ways that um, make things a bit clearer, but also kind of give us some space for like what, what a potential is, or what, or what, what a possibility outside of what is happening now is, is, and I think that with a lot of the sci-fi, I mean, it's like I, I haven't seen like um, Ready Player One. It's like a, it's a sci-fi, but like it's like it's still like a white man saving the world. You know, it's like these like reproductions of the same sh uh, stuff over and over <laughs> again. And you know, and so I think that's I think that's definitely kind of like an escapism that that it's going to be one person saving the world first and foremost, or remaking it, you know, in their image, right, you know. And right, I think right, I, right, and I right. think it's like that's Elon Musk right there, you know. Like it's like that is if if you want to know what like a lot of the lineage of these like Eurocentric, you know, patriarchal kind of like white, white supremacist like media, like that is it. I'm, I'm, watch, I'm listening to his, um, his autobiography right now and like that was his thing since he was 12 years old because he's been watching these films and all of this stuff and like he actually knows how to make rockets, you know? So this is the stuff that happens, you know? Um, and it's, it's, a, you know, it's a disparate example, but I mean, we can... We, I guess well, we can I, I mean, just to bring a little dispelment in, in, in the context of what you're saying, which I said at another speaking engagement here. I mean, are you guys familiar with gravity? Not the movie, but the essence of gravity? <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that the people on the space station have problems having to be up there. You know the guy, Kelly, who stayed up there for a whole year, and his twin who was down here, they were gonna go, mm -hmm. they've got different DNA now. That's sort of interesting, I thought. But also the thing that you care so dearly to, which we were talking about, it, which is vision. Mm -hmm. Your eyes don't stay in the same place if you stay in outer space because grab, there's no gravity and your eyeballs will shift and your internal organs move around inside this cavity you call your body. So now how are we gonna go to all these other places they're talking about and maintain a full body in space. I'm totally into that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's potential right there. <laughs> but maybe this also relates, I mean, you were, you were, you were talking earlier upstairs about, um, uh, about doggerel trying to, trying to reposition these things. And, right, and right, right, right. I mean, just you know, talking mm -hmm. about the Eurocentric kind of mm -hmm. um, dominance that you're you're talking about within science fiction. I mean, that was where you were. The, the impulse with doggerel was coming. Well, coming doggerel in that sense, because it's you know, what is irregular and a variation. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, to one degree, I'll make it very simple. Uh, if you're on a date and the person that you're with does something that is un unrecognizable, how do you react to it? Okay, because we have doggerel moments all the time that we don't pay attention to. Matter of fact, sometimes we excuse them and say, oh, that's okay, he, he'll, they'll, they'll be all right, they won't do that again, mm -hmm. you think. And to whatever degree that that doggerel moment, if you will, does, does it get extended? And to some degree, that's what I'm, I'm playing with in my, mm -hmm. my narrative constructs. Mm -hmm that uh, some of my videos, the narrative or the doggerel moment, if you will, 
it gets extended mm. and it goes on and on and, and, some, and as it says, sometimes it's a comedic verse. Mm -hmm. So then you're laughing. You're laughing at something irregular, but you don't question why you're laughing. Mm -hmm. So this, that's how I got into dog row. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, um, uh, I guess my question is like, what do you think about the dog roll moment that um, that then becomes recognizable. Is it still irregular? Are there, are there, um, cause you're, you're kind of like retool, or not retooling, but um, uh, doing these kind of, I'd say kind of as, like video assemblage types of like moments of like re, this recreating um, um, or the re-imaging over and over and over again. And so these, these irregular things wind up becoming kind of like solid in a lot of ways in their understanding. Um, they f feel like that sometimes. Um, no, maybe you, not. You, you, you're, you're, hitting yeah. on, you're yeah. hitting on a point. I mean, that's, that's just like taking a nail and hitting it on, you know, hitting the, hitting the, hitting the nail with the hammer, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And the more you do it. I mean, I think there's a guy who's a president that keeps doing that. I mean, we have mm. a dog world president, actually. Mm. I mean, this whole notion of something that happens again and again, and whether or not you recognize it as irregular, or did you excuse it and say, okay, I'm gonna embrace that now because I see the regularity in the concept of it coming again and again, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's what you're getting at. And I recognize that, this, like I said, the first time I made, uh, or yeah, when I made uh, Inconsequential Dog Rope, it was considered very fast because I did, at that time was considered, now this is 1980, fast editing. This was actually, in some ways, was pre-MTV. So nowadays, you see things edited in such a fast motion. I mean, the thing is, when you go to a gallery, how much time do you spend in front of an, an actual painting, since I come from a painting background? Two, three seconds? And the registration of that image, you make and move on. And if the image has that kind of strength that makes you stay there longer than those little few seconds, the artist is successful. They've got you concentrating on the concept, okay? So in that sense, when you edit fast like that, uh, I think the, the, the premise I was thinking of is, is called paramnesia. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, to that extent that when you, if you're driving down the highway and you see an image, and you do this all the time, maybe not on the highway, just uh, on the subway or something, and you see this image, and then later on down the road, you, that image re comes back to you in your memory, okay? That is the premise that I recognized back then that I wanted to establish about this uh, collage, if you were calling it, or montage of images because I figured, okay, if they're going fast enough, sooner or later, one of them's gonna stick. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where the time has gone, but we are in our remaining couple of minutes and Sandra, I know, or I know we haven't even talked about Superman or the poor performance class we took with Chris Burden or <laughs> studying with Charles White and Betty Saar. I mean, we could be here for many days and it would not get boring. But um, you were talking, Sandra, about this interest in the edit, and I think that relates a lot to the way that you foreground the kind of tools of production and make those visible. I don't know if there's something you want to say on that line. I mean, I think um, I think Elisa has kind of like touched on that really, okay. really well. Yeah. Well, um, because we just got the the signal, actually. Um, okay. Rebecca, any okay. concluding remarks? No, I'd just love to hear the two of you in conversation. I mean, this has been <laughs> dog roll. I think you've made a real impact here talking well, about dog roll. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to our audience. We really appreciate you. Um, coming along for this experiment with us. And thank you so much to Sandra and Ulysses. Um, we told you you would be on TV, so <laughs> here we all are. So thanks very much, uh, so much to Philly Cam. Um, and please give everyone a big round of applause.